Welcome to the Making Up the Numbers podcast. The Making Up the Numbers podcast is sponsored by Hope Technology, Revolution Bike Park, and the world's finest independent mountain bike magazine, Single Track. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of the Making Up the Numbers podcast. I'm George Thompson, and today's show is going to be a little bit different. Firstly, because I'm flying solo, Jack's away shooting for the 2021 O'Neill catalogue. And secondly, because we're talking all things suspension and bike setup. And joining me, well, I don't think we could have a more esteemed bunch. First up, to talk telemetry, and by that we mean the measurement of the bike's interaction with the ground, we have the founder of Motion Instruments, Rob Shizuki. I got that pronunciation right there, didn't I, Rob? Is that- That's close. It's uh, Shikuski, but it's the gift. Sorry, Shikuski, Rob Shikuski. <laughs> then to talk bike setup, we have the global technician at Fox, Jordi Cortez. That's right, isn't it? Jordi Cortez, I'm right there. Perfect. And tying the whole thing together, we have a man who needs a little introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. He's the GOAT, the greatest of all time, three time world champion, three time World Cup champion, 21 downhill World Cup wins. 78 World Cup podiums and 10 Downhill World Championship medals. It's, it's Mr. Greg Minar. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks, George. Thanks for having us. Thanks. You've, had, you've had one hell of a career. <laughs> when, you, when you came into this sport all those years ago, did you ever dream you'd achieve so much, Jordy? Me. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd try and start the show off with a little bit of a gag. <laughs> <laughs> what have I achieved? <laughs> Rob, I was going to say... He's now internationally known. I mean, I've seen him <laughs> signing autographs at airports, <laughs> signing ladies' breasts, a whole lot. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Rob, I was going to start this conversation with yourself because... My natural train of thought was to start with data logging and then move on to kind of adjusting the setup. But I think we probably need to start before that, really, because I imagine it's important to have a good setup before you start logging, really. So you're using it for refinement rather than starting from scratch. So, Jordy, talk us through where most riders are starting now. Is it, is it 25% sag? Is that still the norm? Uh, no, not really. I mean... You can look at 25 to 30% in the rear probably as a safe guess. And for the simplicity, I think we'll use high level riders for this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And we're generally seeing around 15% sag in the front. Right. So 15 in the front, 25, 30 in the rear. So super firm up front. Well, I mean, you have to think about weight distribution and what these bikes are designed to do. So you point them downhill and your flat sag measurements kind of go out of the window. Yeah. But yeah, that's where we're aiming for to start. Okay. And my next question was going to be how many World Cup riders are running what is recommended by their manufacturer, but I'm guessing that's pretty much out the window there. Yeah, probably not many. Not many. And then after that, so you set the sag, you dial in the recommended settings from the Fox chart. Other manufacturers are, of course, available, but... Is that the, yeah. that's where they'd start, yeah? And are you looking to keep both the fork and the shock rebound speed similar now, or, or would you still run the, the rear slightly slower? I think the rear tends to be a touch slower, for sure. Yeah. But the ultimate aim is to get it to get it balanced. It is to get it balanced, but balance doesn't always mean that the front and rear are moving in the same speeds. It means that the setup is right for you. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's down to the, ultimately it's still down to the individual. Yeah. Yeah. My, my teammate over here, Neil, he always talks to me about bouncing on Chris Kavarik's bike over a decade ago and he, his rebound was super slow on his shot. Is it still possible to kind of balance a, a bike if you have a back end really, you know, kind of di- well with different rebound speeds? Uh, I mean, you could balance it. It would be yeah. wrong. <laughs> you could do it. I mean, you can balance anything in the right way or the wrong way. But again, it's, well, it's down not to necessarily the... wrong. I guess it's it's just not as fast as what it could be in terms of how fast the bike can go. Yeah, you know that's kind of changed over time. So although it might be slow, and it's not necessarily wrong. It's just it's what we've learned not to be as quick as a, a faster rebound. 
you know, you rebounding bike. And I'll so, remember that next time you give me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that I, you'll forget like many things. So I'm pretty safe there. <laughs> am, am I right? Am I right in thinking that most World Cup bikes now are then firmer and run a faster rebound than, than previous generations? Is that something you've you, you've noticed, Greg? Oh yeah, definitely. It's 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 completely different. I mean, I remember in 2001 um, doing some testing and. You know the back end was super slow, and um, I mean the fork was obviously a little bit quicker than the rear end, but yeah, the suspension was slow. And, and over time, it, it's it's slowly sped up, and it's something that's I've I've had to alter and adjust to as well. You know, yeah. I'm used to it. Um, I think my whole riding styles had to adapt to it and and get a better feel for it. It's, it's a completely different way of riding. And how so? Talk us a little bit through how things you had to do to adapt well i think you know when you rebound slow you can attack into stuff and you, and you push the bike really hard and aggressively into things yeah um when the bike's starting to rebound fast the bike's coming back at you a lot so you're having to muscle the bike down yeah um obviously when you're off the brakes you, you're pushing forward a lot faster so before you can get the bike to like sink in slow down quite easily get on the brakes and um then get into the section you're in now the bike's you're trying to control the bike and slow it down to be able to be in the right speed into the section. So it's a, it's a, before I felt like you could really um, muscle the bike and push it hard in, in every kind of way. Yeah. And now you're trying to muscle the bike to be in control of it to, to, to go forward. Jordi, something I've heard a lot over the years is that a, a well-tuned race bike will feel pretty rubbish if you try and ride it at 80%. Is, is that true? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's true for anything that you set up to do one thing well. Yeah. He, he, we run into the same thing with enduro riders that that end up testing on a single track because you learn exactly where that bike gets put and your line choice is down to fractions of an inch yeah so if you slow those speeds down you're not taking the same lines you're not hitting the same gaps so yeah. it, it's not going to feel the same and generally yeah it's not going to feel as good <laughs> and it, it's set up to to absorb those really big hits so if you're not generating those hits, you won't be using all the travel. A bit. I, I don't know if it's necessarily the big hit thing. Right. Um, it's just a little bit different. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know that bikes, the rebound thing is definitely true, that rebound speeds have picked up. I think it's more a technology thing that, that suspension's gotten so much better that it's far more adjustable and it's able to hold a specific setup a lot better than it used to. But I don't know that bikes are that much stiffer um, because suspension designs have gotten better. Yeah. Suspension itself has gotten far better and you can't just make it stiffer and hope to hold on. Yeah. You can make it a little bit more progressive. You can add a little more damping, but it's nothing crazy for the most part. A lot of it's just the rider. They're just, they're getting better and they're able to push better setups faster. Uh, and the riders are, are a lot stronger than they were. Most of them. Yeah. Some of the old ones are still. <laughs> 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 Jordi, I think I heard you say somewhere that most of the World Cup riders are within a, a click or two of each other. Is that correct? And I presume you, you were talking about the forks there because the rear shocks will be a bit different dependent on frame design? they're still within a very close set of parameters. Yeah. I mean, going by spring rates and pressures and, you know, the settings just aren't that far off. George, you're asking someone who battles to count clicks if all the clicks are one or two <laughs> variants. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know if this is a real question. You know, that Geordie's capable of answering this. That's why everybody's within a couple of clicks. Exactly. So there's no real, not that much difference between, say, a single pivot and a, a VPP. I mean, you just can't, you can't have a bike that's way out there and make up for it with suspension. So most of these bikes are within a, a relatively close envelope that the, the yeah. tuning comes. I mean, yeah, it's all relatively close based on spring. Yeah. Okay. So... A lot of people who listen to this podcast are racers. 
and they should all have a pretty decent setup. So let's move on to telemetry a little bit and bring Rob in. Rob, tell us a little bit about the motion instrument system and how it came about and, and how it works. Yeah, I think I think first I want to talk about your albums behind you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like a good collection. I, uh, um, yeah, the motion instruments basically started out with, um, you know, two frustrations in my life. One was my career. And then the other was just not being able to be on my bike as much as I want to. And when I got on my bike, um, you know, I just had challenges setting it up. So this was, you know, going back to my motorcycle days. And um, I just remember having this stutter bump problem. And I tried everything, you know, oil viscosity, oil height, springs, settings, and finally, you know, worked through it. But you know, with my limited time on two wheels, I, you know, I, I just, you know, my motivation in life is pretty much fun. And that's, you know, setting up a bike is not fun. So then I looked at, you know, I'm an electrical engineer by trade. And so I, you know, I've got an oscilloscope in my desk. I've got, you know, logic analyzer. I can, I have all these tools at my disposal to, to debug problems. And I just thought, man, it'd be nice to have something on my bike to actually look at the data and see what the heck's going on so I can make some informed decisions versus just kind of guessing. Cause I'm not a, you know, I'm not Jordy, you know? Yeah. So that's, um, that was kind of the genesis of the idea. And then at the time I, I had the iPhone four. So I was kind of a late adopter to the smartphone and that was my first access. you looking at an app and I thought, man, it'd be kind of cool to have an app to, you know, look at suspension. But at the time, you know, IOT devices were pretty crappy. We were probably at like Bluetooth three at the time and yeah. couldn't really get the data rates that I wanted um, to, for suspension. But then, you know, over <clears throat> you know, the next couple of years, I just, you know, kind of kept at it and, um, you know, architected the system, yeah. you know, basically in a, in a white paper of kind of what I think we would need. Um, and that's, that's kind of how that started. And what's been the biggest challenges of bringing it to market? Well, I mean, I think there was a bunch of challenges. So the first one was, you know, we, we designed this fork sensor and we, we were pretty proud of it. And we showed it to Greg, you know, three years ago. And he, he basically just said, yeah, you know, this, you know, nice try, but, you know, you've got to quantify the bike for me. I mean, I, I need to, you know, I, if I don't understand balance, then, yeah. So this, this thing that you built is, while well, it's a good first step, it's like, you know, it's like, not going to solve the problem and nobody in the world club is going to use it. So then, you know, that kind of started, you know, us down the path of, you know, yeah, well, so now we have to get multiple sensors talking to the phone. We had to keep those signals in synchronization. We had to be able to sustain the data rate. And then, you know, it's Bluetooth. So you're going to get drop packets. Um, so you, you've just got to deal with all the complexities of, a, you know, that system and then make it reliable. Yeah. Um, so that anybody can just use it and the thing doesn't you know, fall apart. So, I mean, I'd say there's thousands of challenges that we went through to kind of get the product to market, but it started off with just, yeah, the product that you thought you were going to revolutionize the world with is not even a first step. So earlier, well, right at the start, I said the ultimate aim was probably to get a balanced bike. Does that differ based on rider style? Obviously, Jordy said it does a little bit, but how does the, the system deal with something like that? Well, you know, at the end of the day, your bike needs to support the rider. So, you know, different riders ride the bike differently. So they're off yeah. the front or off, or off the back, like Greg, or, you know, somewhere in the middle. So, you know, you're going to have a setup that kind of wants to support, you know, the way that you ride the bike. Yeah. And, you know, I would say our system while it, you know, there's a lot of data in there, it, it does not give you like, here's your settings. You know, there's, that just wouldn't be credible. And we, we could spend 10 years on that and it still wouldn't work for everybody. So we just said, look, what we're going to do is quantify the bike. And that means, you know, the bike's got a model, it's got a leverage ratio. It's got some head tube angle, you know, we're going to quantify that bike, how it interacts with the ground and yeah. the rider should use it as a sixth sense. And so when, as they get their bike set up, they can see the data change and then they kind of know what they want. Now, you know, you're going to have to put the time in. I mean, there's no magic wand that says, you know, here's your, here's your balanced bike. Yeah. You're still going to have to, you know, do a lots and lots of testing, but it's, you know, as you see the data change, which you will, you'll know like, okay, at this track, I like these settings and this is why the bike felt good on that day. 
Okay, Greg, Greg, being so tall, would you say you ride off the back a bit more than someone like, say, Troy or Amare? Oh, definitely. I mean, and, and that's why, you know, over the years, as the bike grows, I think I, I, I've always struggled to find that setting that's, that's, you know, the ideal setting. You know, although I feel good on the bike and I try and get the bike and adjust the bike to that feeling, um, you'll go from a track like Fort William yeah, and you'll feel amazing you set up on the bike you got a Leo gang, which, you know, people think is, is probably one of the flattest tracks we race on. But when, when Leo gang turns down, it, it's probably got more gradient than most World Cups. So um, suddenly you go from two tracks that should be relatively similar that people think, you, and you've got the same setup, but the bike's completely out. Yeah. And this is where the telemetry comes in, because you know that uh, one run with the telemetry on the bike, you know exactly that your fork's too soft due to you know, pick the fork up and you can just make these slight adjustments straight away. And someone like myself who is either too far forward or too far back, um, you, it, it really um, amplifies the, the mistakes in the suspension. So um, I think that's to me why I, I, I think it's way forward. Um, and why waste all this time on track when you, when you just have, a, you know, something so easy as the gradient of the track that, that you're fighting against. Is it something you would use right from the get-go, Greg? Kind of, or do you need a couple of runs to get up to speed and to, you know, if you had it on for the first run of a day at a World Cup and the data said you need, you know, more pressure in your forks, would you listen to it straight away, or do you know I was only riding at ninety percent on that run? I yeah, well, like Jordi was saying earlier, we we're talking about the the different pace of riding. I mean. When you're in a, an attack, an attacking race position, yeah. you're going to use, um, as, you know, all the travel on the bike. If you back it down to ninety percent, like we probably practice and and test that, um, suddenly you're not using all your travel. So, yeah, I, I like to use the system straight on straight off the bat on on track. Yeah, um, I probably wouldn't adjust too much initially, um, but it's definitely going to give you a feel of balance. You'll be able to see it within the graphs. So, um, for sure, if you trickling down the track, you're going to have a lot more weight on the front than you probably would when you're off the brakes. So, um, but it, it, it definitely will pick up stuff. I mean, if you're not feeling right and you're feeling like you're pushing hard and the front's too low or, or something's kicking, you can definitely go straight to the data and eliminate some problems instead of having to like trial and error your way through. Yeah. You quite famously run a really high front end. Is that mm. something that you feel is specific to you? And, and the reason I ask that is because I remember seeing Santa Cruz launch a, a, a new version of the V10. I can't quite remember which iteration it was, but at the first race after the launch, you had a, a stack of spaces under the stem. And I was quite surprised they kind of hadn't designed that out. Do you feel it's something that's specific to you? I think it's something specific to my heart, really. Um, yeah. You know, being so tall, you know, the bottom bracket of most bikes are are kind of in the same, in, in within this, you know, a couple of millimeters here or there. But you know, your bar height needs to be relative to your bottom bracket height, and you know, relative to the height of the rider. Yeah, um, I've got really long legs, so it, I feel like I'm really heavy on the front end when my bars aren't raised. So um, that's why I lift the front end up. Okay, I, I I'm six foot six, so. I have been copying you and uh, so your problems are bigger than mine. Yeah. You're my explanation. Yeah. Whenever people look at it and go, why is that? Why have you got all those spaces on there? Rob, I think we, well, we've had several riders over the, the last year or so on the podcast. And whenever I ask them about telemetry, they all pretty much give me the same answer. Capturing data isn't an issue. Interpreting it is the hard part. That's why Loic's mechanic Jack is so special. All the most swimming instruments data is recorded in, in the app. And then based on that data, the app calculates where you can improve, make improvements or suggest improvements. Dumb question, maybe, but how does the app know how to interpret that data? Is it algorithms? Yeah, our app doesn't know how to d interpret anything. Um, really, a bike is just a system of levers, right? You've got a lever on the front and in the back um, with some forces and those Forces are damping forces and spring force. And really all we wanted to do is quantify, you know, how the front and rear are working together um, going down on, you know, on going down the trail. And yeah. so um, our app doesn't give you any magic settings. 
No. It just quantifies how the bike interacts with the ground. And, you know, like we had, we had, you know, data, you know, within six weeks of kind of starting the project, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was just a bunch of squiggly lines and yeah. it didn't tell you anything. So, you know, we spent the next three years just, you know, asking questions of the data and writing software to, you know, break that down. So it's kind of like, yeah, you're in a forest and you see some trees, but, you know, if you get a 30,000 foot view of that, you, you kind of see things like, oh, wow, there's a river over here. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, green on the north side of the country and, you know, dry in the south. So you get a landscape of what's, what's happening. And that's kind of what, what we did um, in just quantifying everything we could about the bike. Um, yeah. Compression, rebound, high speed, low speed, and balance for all of those things. Well, one of the really things that I found it interesting is that you, you compare it with Strava. Is, is that correct? Well, so there's a use case where we wanted to be able to isolate sections of trail. So whether you're an enduro racer and you know, you've got a bunch of stages that you want to look yeah. at your data on, we just wanted to make it easy to, you know, hey, just, just let the app record. And then after the fact, be able to isolate, hey, what was, what was stage one? You know, what was stage two? Or even at like at a downhill track, you know, what was this section, you know, this segment of the downhill run? Can I easily isolate that data? And so um, we just use Strava for that. And, you know, other than that, like, you know, a lot of people hate Strava. Um, you know, it's, as soon as I say this, they're probably going to, you know, kick my app off for, uh, <laughs> you know, using their data. But, you know, we feed them a lot of data and, you know, they haven't been very nice to their partners, but so far they're still working with us. But at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, the, just because you're collecting data, a lot of it's going to be junk. Um, so you, you, you've got to focus your analysis on stuff that matters. Yeah. And by being able to upload your tracks to Strava and then download them, download the segments, Yeah, you can just point and click to which segment of the trail you want to look at. So I have a shock quiz and I hadn't used it for a good few, probably 12 months. And then I put it on a few, you know, before I knew I was doing this podcast, just to remind myself of, of how kind of telemetry works. And that is the thing that's kind of frustrated me that I go out, I'm working on trying to get the KOM on a particular segment, but I put it on and it records the whole ride, if you know what I mean. I, I want it to make my bike better just for that segment. So that's something that, that you can do in, in yours. Yeah. I mean, the problem with the shock was is that it's not actually even collecting data. It's just, it's a bunch of algorithms that looks at, you know, data as it's going by. And then it's also measuring air pressure. So, you know, in chemistry, PV equals NRT, you know, that's, you know, temperature is going to change as the shock heats up. So, you know, it's hard to derive position of the fork or shock based on air pressure. So, I don't know. It's, um, it, you know, know, like I said, it's, the, it's, it's algorithm based and, you know, ours is really data based, um, yeah. like a lot of data, you know, megabytes it, per, per run. And the, the shock was, does tend to try to tell you what to do. And that's where it went haywire. Just uh, yeah. don't bother. How do you mean try that's where it went haywire just well it says it says oh you need to do this yeah but it doesn't have the ability to actually know if that's what you need to do it's just guessing through its algorithm right so it's then it's so tell... basic that it's probably going to send you down the wrong path most of the time okay the pro motion instrument system retails at $1300 which is a pretty decent investment but you have to ask how many people would be kind of better off on a properly set up shock from two years ago than a, a poorly set up brand new one. Is that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, whether you got a shock from two years ago or, you, you know, one that just came out, um, you still want to get it set up for your bike. And, you know, I'd say 95% of the people shouldn't buy one of our systems. If you're a racer, then, you know, it's like having a torque wrench in your toolbox. You should have data for your bike. Yeah. And you should be collecting it and analyzing it and learning from it. Yeah. But if you're just a, you know, like a ri everyday rider, then, you know, you should just rent one from your bike shop or somebody, you know, a friend yeah. that's got one. And who is the target market? Is it the local bike shop renting it out? So we, I mean, a big chunk of our customers now are suspension OEMs, um, bicycle OEMs, yeah. um, race teams. We've got like seven, you know, downhill World Cup teams using our stuff now. 
um, enduro races around the around the world. Yeah. And you know, enthusiasts like me, you know, they're kind of, you know, maybe you know, kind of the fast guy in their group, but not like a World Cup, you know, racer. And they're yeah. geeks. So yeah, there's a lot of geeks out there that you know want to get their bike, get the best of their bike. So. So you said bike brands are using it. Are they using it kind of at a prototype stage with their with their frame? Uh, yeah, th- through the whole through the whole life cycle of the bike. So for yeah. early prototype, you know, through the mule stage all the way to race. And we've got customers that are, you know, coordinating data between their race teams and their product management and their engineering and yeah. development. So I think I read somewhere about you measuring the effect of Cush Core. Is that right? Yeah. So we, if you look at their marketing, um, in fact, I got the Kreft shirt on. Uh, Adam's uh, one of our, yeah, they, they've got a couple of systems from us, one for the bike and one for the yeah. moto. But um, yeah, I um, I did the Downeyville race a couple of years ago and had some, the data on my bike. And, you know, I could feel a difference when I had a Kush core in my front tire, actually both tires. And after the race, I was like, oh, I should, you know, see if I could tease out what was different about the bike. And yeah. um, it was pretty obvious um, that about 15% of the compression strokes just went away. So the, I was measuring from the top of the baby head run all the way to town. So Greg and Jordy know this section, but it's just, you know, a picture of rocks about this big yeah. for miles, miles, miles. And um, so That's with cool. and without Cush Core, keeping everything the same, suspension setting, tire pressure are the same, you know, just that all that data just pushed to the left. And then the, about 12% of the, you know, vibration data just went away as well. So That's it actually, you know, absorbed energy. Yeah. Jordy, back to you then. What are, you, what are your thoughts on telemetry? Does it feel like it's taking a bit of pressure off you or do you feel like you're being second guessed at all? Neither really. I mean, it does take a bit of pressure off me. I think it, in, in most world cup situations, you're in a time crunch. Yeah. And if someone is set up with telemetry, it makes things a lot easier to read and you can get things done quite a bit quicker. Yeah. Um, It's tough for me because you still need to know the athlete and you need to know what's going on. There's so many other factors involved, but telemetry narrows down one of those factors and lets you, lets you make an informed choice rather than kind of, guessing and then re-guessing and then yeah. zeroing in so without it you're kind of relying on a mix of your own product knowledge rider feedback and how accurate do you think rider feedback is i, I think it was reese wilson on a previous episode told us about a story from the moto world with eli tomac walking into the pits and saying i need this adjustment this adjustment and this adjustment and the technicians looked at the data and said no what you actually need is the, the complete opposite to that so they ignored what he wanted and and followed the data it's tricky it's it's it depends on the rider and it depends on the day and the track uh but certain settings tend to mimic each other compression can feel like rebound and rebound can feel like compression depending on which way you're going so uh, it is hard (laughs) i can't do it at the level that some of these guys can no of course so having data there kind of backs up what i would have said do you do you think kind of mass market (laughs) telemetry is where where we're heading yeah yeah is that is it i'm not sure how mass but at least in the near future telemetry is going to be the thing and who knows where that telemetry is going to get integrated into say in five years or 10 years yeah is it something fox are looking into or is it i don't know (laughs) i mean obviously everybody's looking into it yeah yeah and and all of us have used it and still use it from time to time yeah so greg has using the telemetry kind of thrown up any surprises for you yeah just uh it surprises me what geordie does sometimes on that suspension that's the only real surprise <laughs> no it's uh it's it, it does eh? you can you know we were out testing in portugal and uh <clears throat> straight away just through the numbers that i'm used to seeing 
I could see that the fork was rebounding way too slow. And it was just, you know, within a run, quick adjustment. And, you know, I was just looking elsewhere. I just did not think the fork was rebounding um, too slowly. So it does always surprise you now and then. Um, I just want to go back on what you're talking about. Like, is it is it for like the mass the masses? You know, I I have a bike shop here in in South Africa, and yeah. you know, going riding with some friends now. You know, e bikes is I've got friends who race motocross who've never been into bicycle or riding, and uh, you'll be surprised what a difference just you know ten twenty percent difference to a better set up bike. How much more confident the rider is, and how much more capable he becomes and enjoys the ride. So. Yeah, you're going to go spend a bunch of money on a bike or suspension or anything else. It's not set up right. You don't gain the confidence of the new product and then you don't enjoy it as much. And so, you know, like Rob's got a system now that, that can go through the retailers who can set up bikes and suspension for people. I think that's the way it's definitely going to go. Yeah. I think it's going to reach more people than you realize. I think um, a bike that's that's just 20, gives you 20% more confidence is going to give you a way more enjoyment on the trail. You're suddenly going to be jumping slightly bigger jumps than you're used to. You're going to be railing corners a bit better and, and with confidence. And with confidence, you just ride better and enjoy the ride. So I definitely think that telemetry can point the riders, the general rider in the right position and then have a bike that's pretty well set up. I agree with you completely. I've, I even, like I said before, getting the shock was out the other night, it, it adds another dimension to a ride when you come back and you – you look at your, say, Strava segments, how have I done tonight? But then you also can now go and look at the bike of how was the bike performing as well as kind of how were we performing together, which is, sure. you know, which is interesting to everybody. Do you follow the data then now? Is that, do you take... I've been data? following it for some time. You know, it's not just a, a given what numbers work and what don't, you know, and I still go through the, you know, the, I have quite a sensitive feel on the bike and, um, I still try and aim for the feeling that I want and then try and look at the data and correlate. And once I feel really good, like when there's time, you know, I'll be out in Portugal testing with the team yeah. and uh, the telemetry might be on and we're just, you know, um, collecting data as we go along. And then once I feel really good on the bike, you can see the data, you can see what the numbers are and then you can start to adjust and try and, and, and get the bike going a little quicker yeah. or you can go back to those same settings to the numbers you know. Has the... The, the increase in wheel size to 29, did, has that affected how you set the bike up at all? Because the 29-inch wheel will roll over stuff easier. It hasn't really, yeah. Um, nah. To be honest, I, I don't feel much different to to on the 27.5. Okay. What well, Something I did want to ask you, as I mentioned before, I'm kind of six foot six, you're six three, I think. You have the same amount of tire on the ground as, say, Danny Hart or Troy Brosnan, but you're obviously heavier and you have a higher center of gravity. Do you think that it's possibly an, ad, an advantage in taller riders sticking with a full 29 front and rear? Because when I switched to the 29, I noticed that I had a lot more grip. Mm. Is that one of the reasons why you're not on the mullet? No, to me, I, I'm not on the mullet because I don't feel it started off in a, in a, kind of natural and organic way. I, I I don't feel like it was a directional push to improve what product we've got out there. I think it was a great marketing plan to try and make um, some bits of races um, be a little happier without offending the bike brands they are. <laughs> and that's how it developed and that's how it came about. You know, Loris has come along and he's gone, he's tried the ballet, he feels comfortable and for a reason being that he feels he can get over the back wheel a bit more. And yeah. to me, that's more of a natural push. To me, that's a great way to go that route. But I don't really have that problem. I've got really long legs, and uh, I can get over the back end quite easily. So um, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, for for Loris's position, I, I get that totally. And uh, but for me, I, I'll probably stick to twenty nine. Yeah, Jordy, as you said earlier. Well, suspension is a bit of a movable feast. Greg talked about the differences kind of between setting the bike up for Fort William and, and then for Lear Gang the week after. How much change do you see top guys making for, for different tracks? I mean, again, it's not massive. I think it's a little bit of pressure here or there, a couple of clicks. Uh, a lot of times it's things other than clicks and pressures. At such as moving forks through and the clamps, 
or raising bars or rotating bars. Yeah. You know, something that adjusts your posture back to a, a level, basically. I mean, we're all trying to get things balanced, right? And yeah. the steeper it is one way, the higher up the bars need to go. Flatter yeah. tracks, you can you can drop those things and speed up steering. So there's there's many outside factors as well as the internals of suspension that that can change as well. So but it's not massive. So let, let's you, you mentioned before, Greg Fort William and Leah Gang. What, what would you do differently between those two tracks? Um. Normally raise the front end. The hardest thing on, on a bike setup going into World Cup. So you come up off for William and your bike set up for a race run. You leave it to, to kick it off practice or training in, in, in Leo Gang and something doesn't feel right. So um, a big mistake is guys and, you know, soften up the bike and, and get the bike more supple and, and move in better. And then as you get faster on track, you start to stiffen things up a bit and you almost end up back to where you started just with more confidence riding on track. So yeah. um, it's really hard. Leo Gang, I definitely go higher on the handlebars. Yeah. Um, it's, it doesn't feel right in, you know, that flat section in the middle. But when you, when you ride Leo Gang, the, the top is pretty steep and the bottom is really steep. So to me, I'm, I like to just make sure that front ends up and, you know, you know, so I'm able to let off the brakes and let the bike roll a bit. And what would change, settings would you change between kind of a wet and a dry race? Not really that much. No. Um, maybe we might just, you know, uh, run slightly uh, lower tire pressure. Um, sometimes, you know, maybe a bit softer, but not really. We try and keep the, the bike relatively the same. Okay. Jordy, do you think there are many World Cup riders now who are still losing valuable seconds because of a poorly set up bike or do you think the bikes are pretty much all you know all very good now the setups are all bang pretty close i think i think setups are still all over the place okay i i maybe in the top five they're they're relatively sorted yeah but i i don't know of a lot of brands that do what we do as far as being at the races and tuning. Yeah. I think a lot of times it's left up to individual teams to do things. And the suspension is a weird thing. If you don't have a big pool of information to pull from, you end up going off in these pretty random directions. Yeah. A lot like bike design where people think they need to reinvent things all the time and make something look completely different when all you really need to do is make what you have work well. And how many, how many times do you know that if, let's say, we're at a World Cup and you, it's practice day one, you, you've got a rider telling you he or she's not happy with their setup, but you know the forks are running fine, you know the settings are around the same as everybody else's, and you kind of suspect he or she's just not having a very good morning. Have, do you ever just take the forks and take them in the back and bring them back out and say, try this. No, no, I'll just, I'll just tell you. Yeah. I think it's down to you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> honestly. And that's where Rob's system would come in handy because he can point to the data and say, Hey, this is where you want to be. And you're there and you're telling me you want this. Yeah. Okay. And a, a good rider can separate the, their, their mental I don't know how to explain it really but if you're having a bad yeah, day you would know there's, that you there's a you. fair amount of riders that go ah never mind it's just me and there's some that'll that'll blame the one thing that they don't understand which is easy to do yeah suspension's not a cure-all for poor riding ability or poor frame design or anything else yeah it's just that most people don't understand it so it's pretty easy to blame it and do you do you get many riders asking for the, their competitor settings or asking, you know, saying, well, where, whereabouts is Greg? What, what are his settings, sir? Not any good ones. No. It's, I'm sure it's happened a few times in the past, but, I mean, nobody gets to that level and has that little uh, confidence in themselves, I don't yeah. think. Okay. So... 
I'm, it'll definitely every once in a while teammates will I'll say, well, what's so and so doing? <laughs> do you Didn't know, Greg? Do, you. do you know what Loris and Luca are running? Do, do you share that information? I don't. No, I don't. But we do share, like you know, um, we we're testing, and and Loris shared that you know I should try some more high speed compression, and he felt really good. Uh, so I did. You know, I gave it a go, and it was spot on. Um, so yeah, we do share. We do share a fair bit, but. An overall setting, you know, I would have no idea what they are. And Rob, have you been out to any World Cups with the teams and given the, analyzed the data for them there? Not yet. Um, it's funny, people ask, like, what's, you know, what's different about your system from other systems? And I say, well, mine's about 200 pounds lighter because I don't have to be in the tent with those guys <laughs> when we test. So. Um, I could show up at a world cup and nobody would know who I am except for maybe Greg and a couple guys at Trek. Um, yeah. the other ones are just, <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't, they wouldn't know me from a hole in the ground. So, but I, yeah, I, you know, post pandemic, I definitely want to get out and meet, yeah. meet, meet everybody. So. Cool. So I'm not the biggest moto fan in the world, but I believe they have something called a kit, which is kind of like race level suspension. That's, you know, circa $7,000. Then there's factory solutions, which are probably even more. In the downhill world, everybody's pretty much running stock suspension off the shelf. Obviously, those kind of units are produced, mass produced. How much better do you think you could make it, Jordy, if budget wasn't a constraint? I honestly don't think we could make ours a whole lot better. Manufacturing bike suspension is incredibly hard. Right. And I think if you pulled apart a factory kit and then pulled apart one of our products, you wouldn't see a whole lot of difference. And it's why bike stuff is so incredibly expensive relative to other motorsports and, and other products. Um, you could gain little bits here and there by, by remachining a couple little bits or polishing things here and there, but you're talking marginal increases in performance and what are kind of what's coming next what are the next steps in improvement is it probably electronics yeah there's there's no way around it it's just going to make everything faster and systems like rob's as they are now or who knows in the future maybe they'll all be integrated as they are in some other disciplines so in motorbikes, I believe they have movable bushings. I'm not, a, as I say, I'm not a big motor fan, but you can't do that on bikes because the mag lowers a magnesium. Is, is that right? I don't think that's the only reason. I mean, most moto stuff is running an upside down fork at this yeah. time, yeah. which is just a totally different animal. And I think the, I think a lot of times the bushing on the stanchion at the end of the stanchion is attached to the stanchion and slides in the upper. Right. But we're looking at two totally different systems with different amounts of travel that are asked to do very different things. I mean, it, it, the end result is that they need to absorb bumps, but they go about it and, and the, jo the job that they have to do is quite different. And so, no, I don't think you're going to see anything like that anytime soon. And why do you think we don't have upside down forks in, Downhill. They're just not necessary. I mean, we don't have a huge axle overhang with lowers dragging in the dirt like you did with Moto. Right. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not running twelve inches of travel, and it's very hard to build that system in a weight efficient manner and okay. keep it rigid. So, electronic suspension is that. By that, do you mean things where you could change the settings remotely, kind of halfway sure. down the track? Is that something? Remote. Greg, sorry, is that something, Greg? You think would be beneficial? Say halfway down Andorra, you could flick a switch and it would change the settings. Yeah, I mean, we used to run something similar on Honda, actually. So we had an electronic compression, but you know, there's not as much pedaling as as it used to. That was more like electronic lockout. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you could definitely adjust the bike. The, the problem is, is, is you're going to lose time trying to think about it and adjust it. And 
and flick the button. Whereas, you know, you, you lose races by milliseconds. Can you just push on on that same setting? Does it make it quicker? There's there's load more variables in just adjusting to this perfect um, suspension. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we will, I don't know how soon that will come and uh, or if it will come or if it, is, if it will work. It's um, uh, it definitely could be a great, great thing to have. I mean, when you've got uh, if, two very distinctive and very different tracks in one um yeah. then definitely it can work or, or say fire road set you know fire road section yeah i think maybe yeah. something in enduro could work really well where you yeah. have like electronic lockout or something like that um you know some maybe in the longer race like that it it, it would work a little, a little better or a little easier to, to make work well you mentioned the honda um one of the things I think you had on Honda was the spherical bearings. Is that is that correct? I think Chris what? Port has um, brought those back now with the EXT the shot. What? Spherical, the spherical bearings. What's that? I mean, so Chris Porter on his EXT shocks for the Geometrons, when they where the shock fits into the frame you can move the shock around slightly and it oh, goes... offset bushings no it's not offset. no it allows the shock to float a little yeah so it's that when you ah. go into the first cut co- say say you hit a corner that's not quite got that stiction straight away that a tight shock would have it it does allow it to float a little bit didn't i, th- I thought i heard him say that you used to, well he got the idea from honda that, that that it was something you used to have on the honda yeah you got to remember that suspension was designed specifically for that bike. Um, you can't just take that shock and put on any other bike now, because you know um, a lot of you know a lot of bike design relies on that shock in, in some way to either with stiffness or in, anything else. You know, yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't, it would really need to be designed within the bike to take into account that. Oh, that, for sure. Yeah. Is that something you've been looking at? Jordy? No. Okay, well, tell us a little bit about the, <laughs> the new Fox suspension then. Um, I believe, I haven't got a set of the new 40s, but I believe you've given up a little bit of the suppleness to improve the mid-stroke, is that right? Nope, that's not right either. No, tell us about them then. <laughs> what have you done What have you done uh, over the previous 40s? The we've changed volumes in the in the air spring, so it's got a much larger negative volume, which increases initial suppleness and right. also increases mid to end stroke support. So you get a flatter curve. Okay. Flatter doesn't mean less progressive. It means that the progression line doesn't have a big bow in it like most air springs do. Okay. And then a a ramp at the end. We try to flatten that out as much as close to a coil spring as possible. Uh, we've also manipulated the lowers in certain ways to make them a lot better under braking and under forward forces. So we've, we've moved certain things around and we've changed lower leg volume so that you get less ramp out of the lowers as the fork compresses. Okay. Then, sorry, go ahead. What's the disadvantage to increasing the negative spring? As none that I know of. I mean, I guess if you're looking, I was just wondering why why it wasn't done before. If you know what I mean. Well, because it's everything's a process. It's like why didn't we make a Tesla a hundred years ago? Fair point. Right. Everything. (laughs) Everything moves on. And we learn little by little. Uh, The forks are far more supple. So they do feel like they're riding a bit lower in the travel, which some people took a bit of getting used to. Okay. But as far as an all out faster fork, there's, there's no drawback to that. And you mentioned they they were mirroring the coil a little bit more. Well, we're just trying really the nemesis in any kind of setup is is inconsistency, right? And you want everything to be predictable. Yeah. And whether it's a spring curve or a damping curve or a kinematic, 
wavy lines don't work. No. So what we're trying to do is make everything a nice smooth transition yeah. from beginning of travel to end of travel. And air springs are inherently have, they kind of have a little hammock in them as it tips in the negative goes away. Yeah. The, the air spring wallows a bit and then it ramps up hard. So, and we're working to really kind of smooth that out. And do you think we'll see a return to coil forks at any time? I don't see it happening. No. Uh, air springs have gotten so good. Uh, and the weight benefit and noise benefit, uh, at least on bikes, noise is a big deal. Even a, a chain rattling against things can make your bike yeah. feel like something's wrong. So it's really hard to get a silent coil fork on a bike. And at least as far as forks are concerned, I just don't see the reason right now. And talk to us a little bit about fork offset, because that was a big thing last season. But where are you at with the new 40s? We're offering multiple offset options yep. so that you can tune around offset. And do you know where your, what your offset you're running, Greg, is? Sure, he does. Mm. 52. <laughs> Doesn't have it in my uh, notes, yeah. <laughs> Go on, give us I all just your... got, I just got some, <laughs> some <laughs> Marshy's scribbles. You, you um, 52, I think. 52. You can't imagine how many right? people are going to zoom in on that, that you hold <laughs> the screen then, Greg. <laughs> We can have another look. There we go. <laughs> so you're running 52. That's quite a, quite a big offset, I think, isn't it? Uh, it's quite a bit less than they ever have been. Okay. For a 29-inch wheel, yeah. I, I heard rumors of somebody running the Mork Crowns with the new 40s, and it gave you can't them a... can't do that. Well, you could. Yeah, a 37 but... mil offset, I think. People do all kinds of dumb things. <laughs> they seem to like it. Hey, hey have at it then. It was a good <laughs> rider. It was a good World <laughs> Cup rider. He's a top 30 rider. But I'll leave that there. Let's take a quick break there. We'll be back with more after these messages. Um, Greg, obviously the sport's getting more professional every year. Do you think yeah. we're, we're going to see specific setups for specific tracks? A, a 29ers won at Fort William ever since they came to prominence there. It's a flatter track. Can you see somewhere down the line a rider running, say, a 29 uh, one weekend and then a mullet the next? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, you know, if a rider feels more comfortable doing that, then that's probably the direction it'll go. Um, I don't, you know, uh, I don't think it's going to be that specific. Though. I don't think they're going to be able to go. This is exactly what a mullet should be, you know, should be raced on. Okay. Having seen the specialized team data logging at every round, is it something you think we're going to see more of from factory teams? Yeah, definitely. I definitely think more people will be um, using telemetry. Um, yeah. It's, you know, you're trying to eliminate just uh, a waste of time. You, you're trying to be as fresh as you can. You're trying to be in, in, uh, the right frame of mind, you know, the more confident you can be, the fresher you can be going into that final, the the better you can race. So if you can eliminate um, little bits along the way and make it easier for the rider, for sure, teams will definitely do it. Okay. You, obviously, Jordy, you work with the best athletes in the downhill world. What is the most common, outside of that, what's the most common thing you see on someone's bike that you think, that they could improve suspension wise i think the the most common thing is just knowing you need to know where you are whatever it is even if it's wrong yeah you need to be able to say oh i'm at this setting and this setting and i think quite a few people still have no idea so you, you can't get anywhere if you don't know where you are in the first place yeah, you've got to measure, which brings yeah. Rob back into the conversation of 
me- yeah. more and more people measure him. And keep track of it. Yeah. Because okay. just like anything else and data, the same, all these health apps, whatever you're using, nothing works <laughs> right away. Right? Well, health you're seeing, you you're using... looking for padding. Bro, and, come on now. And you want to go a counter? Are you using a calorie counter? <laughs> I do. I, he looks pretty good. I don't know. He's been doing something. I've been drinking. He told me earlier that lockdown had hit him hard. It must be like everybody's coming out of this better. I'm just coming out of it fat and old. Um, Greg, obviously you're you're very very analytical. <clears throat> How much stuff do you how can you go back years? Have you got notes of all your settings for all the tracks from years ago? I, I don't really know. No. Um, you know, every track changes. So although you you might have a, a great setting, you know, well there's a there's a few reasons why we don't. Um, every year Fox are improving their suspension. So what we raced last year, those settings are out the window. We're on yeah. a totally new suspension, even if they change the damp now or something. The bikes are forever evolving, so the suspension is going to adjust. Um, and the tracks themselves, although you're going back to a very similar track, you might have, you know, we, we have used it in years past where we've gone back on on settings just to get like a good base setting yeah. and take it from there. But the tracks do adjust slightly. It's, you know, although the the outline of the track might be in the in, in a very similar position, the, the, the way they tape the track might tighten it up, slow it down, speed it up. You know, this, this, it's, it's forever changing. So it's very hard. And, you know, to dates that was collected 10 years ago is really irrelevant right now. You, with someone like Ratboy, who appeared kind of happy to ride whatever he was given, do you think he could have potentially gone faster with a, a more dialed setup at every round? Or do you think it's better for someone like him to just leave it and don't mess with his head? Well, you know, like Ratboy was, you know, happy-go-lucky guy, but he knew how to set up a bike and he knew what he wanted. So his bike wasn't poorly set up. It was, you know, exactly what he wanted and needed. You know, I'd seen him um, working with the Fox guys to to get what he wanted out of the bike and it worked really well. Yeah. Um, You know, I I don't necessarily think that would have made him uh, even better rider than he was or, or whatever. Maybe, you know, my approach has always been to try and, um, adjust over time. You know, I've been in quite a long time and, yeah. you know, riders come in, a new style of, of riders come in and then they go out and you've got to be able to adapt and, and, and be open-minded to try the, the kind of setup that, that's working for, for faster riders at that time. So, you know, I, I don't think Ratboy could have gone faster. You know, maybe he got stalled out in, in a setup towards the end, but I don't think so. I think uh, Ratboy knew what he was doing. You know, he's not, um, he's not, uh, he doesn't just simply jump on the bike and ride and just enjoy riding. He was sitting up his bike really damn good. With the bikes becoming longer and longer, Lucas Shaw's six foot and he's riding, is it the same size frame as you, both on an XL? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Do you think you could potentially go bigger? Um, I, I think you could. Uh, you know, we, we've really used the the buzz works. So the buzz work gives us, a, you know, I think it's about eight mils further forward. So the, the, uh, center to, to four, um, measurements. So, yeah. um, I know Luca probably runs his, the opposite way. So his bike's a lot shorter than mine. Yeah. I'm in the front end. I kind of felt that we needed to grow the rear end out a bit. So, uh, we had tried that last season and we came into a few issues, you know, um, playing with that that rear end is it can alter so much, and you know not necessarily the the length of the bike, but while we had lengthened the bike, we had adjusted the um, the leverage ratios to try and get the bike to um, to extend the bike out to, to make it work without having to redesign the whole swing arm. Yeah, and towards the end of it, we kind of lost those characteristics that a Santa Cruz V10 has, and that kind of like squats in under brake and allows you to brake hard and then get off the brakes and get back up to speed quite quickly. Yeah. So I found like we'd lost that in it. And so that didn't help with our, um, with our length growing exercise. Um, so I've gone back to a very 
similar setup. I've still grown the bike by about five mils now, so I've chopped it back six from the longest we've been. It's still five millimeters longer on the rear end than it was, but I've got the same uh, um, same linkage system as a standard bike, which I think is 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 a great um, leverage curve and, and setup right now. So, do you know where you're at wheel best wise? Um, so, uh, no, um, <laughs> four sixty five on the. Uh, Chainstay, yeah. Chain yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And when you changed the chain stays, you went up to four seventy. Is that right? Yeah, we went to four seventy one, um, and that was because we didn't we we didn't want to go and re you know remold up a whole new carbon swing arm. No, of course. And so what we did is we lengthened the linkage, and then we chopped it back through the swing arm. And so we extended the bike 20 mils and we brought it back, I think, nine. Um, so it ended up being 11 mils longer. And uh, that altered the, the leverage curve of the bike um, while doing that. But it gave us good feel. I mean, the, the feeling on the bike generally was good, but I didn't like the characteristic of the, the, the suspension. Um, I thought we lost a little bit of it. You know, we lost that really good feeling of braking. And so, so whenever we went into like steep sections of track, I felt the bike pushing forward instead yeah. of squatting in. And uh, I found like I was losing a lot of time in sections like that. So, um, you know, the, the way we've gone about it is to actually um, redo the swing arm into a, a 465. And uh, so I had a 5 mil and 10 mil through testing and I ended up more comfortable on the, on the, on the, the shorter ones. It's still 5 mils longer than standard. I think I, I heard you talk that you know you, you you couldn't just make a big jump to a bigger bike over the you know obviously years ago you were on a smaller bike and it's been a gradual process of getting bigger each time. Do you think we're at the 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 limit now? I don't know. I don't know. I still think that there's possibly a little room to to move. Um, it, I think to 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 store land on it and say it will never grow anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that would be wrong. And I think it'd be the wrong approach to it. You know, when Santa Cruz came out with a bike, we, from the test bike to I think the bike that we're racing now, I think they grew at about 20 miles. And the guys were then going like, you kind of, you know, having a very uh, calculated guess at 20 miles. And we're like, well, you know, worst case, we can bring it back eight miles with the buzz work. Yeah, and you know, as soon as we had that bike built, we're we're pushing forward again and going even bigger than we thought. So, uh, it you know, we we've grown, we've exceeded what we thought. So you know, everything's changing and um and moving. So who knows? Do you, do you look back now and feel like you were at a kind of massive disadvantage years ago when the bikes were smaller? Do you think you could have won more if if this whole process had happened earlier? I think everything's got to progress slowly. You know, it's, I remember in 2001 trying to grow the bike I was on there and then not feeling comfortable and then shrinking it again. And then, you know, it's, it's got to move. Um, it's got to move slowly. I think as soon as you get too uncomfortable, you then, you know, um, you won't be pushing the boundaries on the bike you're on. So I think you've got to, you've got to move in baby steps with it. Um, yeah, I think I could have gone a lot quicker, um, on a bigger bike back then, but at the time, that's what I felt was comfortable. Um, and there, there wasn't anyone else coming with this, um, you know, bigger wheelbase bike going, this is amazing and killing us in time. You know, we're still yeah. competitive on that bike. So that's what we felt comfortable on and that's what we're racing. So the, on to the last couple of things. Um, something Jack was talking to me about. Um, he said you had a chat with him after he came, qualified 61st I think that was in Leo gang and um, the chat you had really benefited him you, you, you said that it's important to stay calm slow everything down and he kind of qualified top 30 at the next three rounds I think how, how do you do that how do you slow everything down are you asking me or Jordy uh, no I'm asking you how, how <laughs> what did you mean by slow everything down do you mean stay calm and how do you stay yeah, it's, calm? I mean, when, you, when you're rushing and racing in, in, in a race, you just, um, you're panicking and you're rushing, you're breaking, you're rushing, you're cornering and, you know, you, you're just losing time rather than gaining time. Um, 
it's uh, it's the hardest thing to, you know, you want to, for myself personally, I want to be nervous. I want to, you know, be have this intense feeling going to race, but you also got to calm yourself down because if, if you're not calm, you can't attack. No. So it's this, it's a big mix of, of trying to stay calm, but be in this like attacking and aggressive mode. And what techniques do you use to try and stay calm? Is it breathing? Is it? I'm not, I'm not usually calm. Uh, <laughs> you know, and that, that's just the hard combination of it. You know, I always look at Marsh and go, damn, I'm nervous. And he goes, good. Cause if you're not nervous, I'd be worried. Okay. So, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. So with Lenza Hyde cancelling last week and Leger today, yeah. we're now down to potentially five races in three or four weeks. Do you have any more insight on if those remaining races are looking solid, any of you? It's hard to say. I mean, it's it's um, it's all up to the the um, federation and and the country. It's in and what the the pandemic's doing in each in each country. So. Um, you know, it's really up to the governments. Uh, UCI are pushing hard and working really hard around the clock trying to make it happen and, and trying to come up with some kind of season. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they've really impressed me with the efforts that have gone into to coming up with a schedule and a season like they have. Um, I think, you know, for sure they're going to be pushing more to try and get some kind of decent calendar, you know, still to be, you know, raced. I know, you know, some events are cancelling, but, you know, it's it's kind of out of everyone's control right now. So, um, but I, I think, you know, they, they've really put the best foot forward trying to get some kind of season together. We had Simon Burney on the show a few weeks ago and he said you were instrumental in, in, in instigating the double header rounds. Given the amount of riders with bonuses tied into their contracts, if they go ahead, I imagine there'll be a good few owing you a, a beer. <laughs> that would be good. I love a beer. I know it's um you know and that that's what's so uh, instrumental to have a, a riders rep within the UCR commission and and uh, you know sometimes when when organisers are looking at things like the UCR trying to figure out races and venues and everything else, it's good to have a riders perspective and um and, and that's super important. So I, I think uh, we as riders are thankful that we have a position in the commission and. And it's it's nice that UCI do come to the riders to to see what they think and feel before making decisions. And if it is five races in three weeks, how do you in- approach such an intense period of racing? Uh, yeah, it's going to be intense. I mean, you're going to be racing two races on one one weekend. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just throw it to the trainers. So I've got two trainers that I work with. Yep. I give them all the info and I just stick to the program. You know, I can't overthink it. It's 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 going to be new for everyone. I don't think you can really uh, emulate a race during practice. I think, you know, you train for to make sure that all the boxes are ticked. But it's going to be hard uh, to try and emulate this without being in that environment. You know, you can um, be ready for it and then plan with it within the schedule once it's released. But it's um, everyone's going to be in the same boat. So... Uh, I don't see a problem with that. I think it's going to be different, but I'm thankful at the same time that UCI have put together what they have. Yeah. Excellent. So I think that's about it for tonight. Thanks ever so much for making the time, everyone. It was a really interesting show, and I hope the listeners will enjoy it. Best of luck to you all this season, if we get a season, of course. Where's the best place for people to keep track of your progress? Is it Instagram for you all? Yeah. 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 So we've got yeah. at Greg Minar at Cody Jotas and at Martian Instruments. That's right. Brilliant. Thanks, George. Thanks for having us. Cool. Thanks, well, thanks, thanks again to our sponsors, Hope Technology, Revolution Bike Park, Schwalb and SingletrackWorld.com. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you've got a sec, please drop us a review. Alternatively, please give us a follow on Instagram at Making Up The Numbers Racing or Facebook.com slash Making Up The Numbers. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back soon.